The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Today, the Equitable Life Assurance Society numbers four and a quarter million members. Of these, many thousands are men and women who have seen the wisdom of an equitable independent 60s plan. What do you mean by independent 60s? Independent 60s means financial independence after your 60th birthday. Freedom from money worries, freedom from job worries. Does that appeal to you? Then you want to listen carefully in about 14 minutes when I give full details on the independent 60s plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Perilous Secret. Unless you, someone in your family, or one of your close friends is engaged in the profession of law enforcement, it is very doubtful that you're entirely aware of the daily, constant presence of crime. The Federal Bureau of Investigation makes that statement with the full knowledge that this official broadcast from its files is heard in many remote hamlets as well as in larger cities. Wherever you may find yourself at the moment, crime is somewhere near. You need no more proof than the fact that one out of every 19 people in this country have fingerprint arrest records. Do you know more than 19 people? If you do, it is possible that at least one of them has such a record at FBI headquarters in Washington. That figure holds true not alone for the slum sections of large metropolitan centers, but for every part of the nation. People are arrested in hovels and in mansions, in bleak corners of the desert and outside the general stores in small towns. They are, in short, arrested everywhere, because crime is everywhere. Criminals have infested the land until they are as much a part of the current scene as the horizon. Take tomorrow morning's edition of your newspaper. Note every story that refers in any way to crime or to criminal operations. And you will discover, possibly with something of a shock, how active America's criminals are and how they affect everyone. Everyone, including you. <laughs> Tonight's file opens in a cheap furnished room located in the downtown district of a large Midwestern city. It is early Sunday morning, but the shade is drawn and no sunlight filters through the single grimy window. A lean, sallow-complexioned man tosses restlessly in bed as someone knocks on the door. Oh, go away. Open up, Charlie. Come back later. Ben Evans. Oh, well, just a minute. Oh. Oh. What's with coming here in the middle of the night? It's ten in the morning, Charlie. Oh, well, I didn't get any sleep. Them pickpockets in the next room had a party last night. Just broke up. You working? About an hour ago. I say. You working? Yeah, yeah. I can't get lucky, Ben. Last night I made a drunk, tailed him, rolled him, and wind up with 23 clams. Like to do a job for me? How much? 500. Oh, well, what's the deal? Ever heard of Al Craig? Yeah, what about him? He called me last week from out of town. He wanted to sell me $30,000 worth of diamonds. Yeah? Yesterday he was on his way to my apartment to deliver them. He came in the building, thought he was being followed. So instead of using the elevator, he took the stairs. A cop telling him? Yes, right behind him. He got nervous and dropped the jewelry into the incinerator chute. The whole thing? Mm-hmm. In the velvet bag. Yeah. Then he kept going, and the cop caught him on the roof. Oh, tough boy. 
But what has it got to do with your giving me 500? Huh? Diamonds don't melt, Charlie. They're still in the incinerator. And it isn't used over the weekend. I can't go into the incinerator, but you can. Now, what do you say? For 500, I'll deliver the whole building. Brick by brick. All I want is that bag. Put on some clothes and go over and get it for me. When? Right now. Mr. Mitchell? Mr. Mitchell? Right here, Dickie. Right you here. promised to tell us a story. Didn't he, Peggy? Yes, you did. The one about the tiger. The one about the tiger. Oh, I so I did, yeah. Can you tell it to us now? I don't see why not. Sit down. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, 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 just imagine that this basement is in the middle of darkest Africa. Uh huh. Over there, where the dumb waiter is, is a forest. Big trees. What and... kind? Oh, all kinds. Over here by the furnace, there's a river with crocodiles in it. Big ones? Oh, terrible big ones. In back of us, for the pipes, is a cave. Big and dark and, and mysterious. Gee. Around the corner where the incinerator is, is the desert. Well, where's the tiger? He's coming, Peggy. He's coming. Now then, <clears throat> in the dead of night, I was walking toward the forest when I heard a strange noise. I wheeled around, and out of the mouth of the cave comes a saber-toothed tiger. <gasps> a ferocious one? Oh, yes. I lower my rifle and start to shoot. But it, it's no use. The bullets bounce off. Hey. Hmm? Oh. Closer and closer he comes. Hey, were you scared? Well, I haven't got time. Pretty soon I'm out of ammunition. I drop my rifle and the tiger jumps. We roll over and over and, and when we stop, He's on top of me. Oh. His giant mouth is open, and he's he's about to bite me. Gee, Mr. Mitchell, what happened? Well, well, now, it suddenly comes to my mind that saber-toothed tigers are very ticklish. They are? Sure, just like you children. So I reach up and brush my finger over his ribs. He, he, like this. <laughs> <laughs> and like this. <laughs> and that's how I escaped. Oh, I'm glad you did. <laughs> oh. oh, somebody's coming down here. It, it, maybe it's that nurse of yours. We're not supposed to be here. Well, say, you, you better hide. Over there, behind the pipes. Okay. Hmm? Come on, Peggy. Okay. You the superintendent? No, uh... No, the fireman. Uh, where's the incinerator? Uh, on the other side of the building. Can you take me over there? Oh, sure thing. Come on. Are they gone, Dickie? Yeah. Well, let's go upstairs. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, police detective Hank Walden approaches the desk of Special Agent Jim Taylor. Hello, Hank. Hi, Jim. What brings you up here on a Sunday? Business. I was in to see your agent in charge, and uh, you're nominated to work with me. Oh, on what? One of the men on my squad recognized a jewel thief named Al Craig last night. Oh, here in town? Yes, over on River Drive. Mm -hmm. He followed him. Craig went into that big apartment house on the corner of River Drive and Madison Street. Must be more jewelry in that building than there is in Tiffany's. <laughs> well, as much anyway. Craig got inside the building and started to walk up instead of riding the elevator. My man followed, staying a floor below him all the way. Craig tried to pull a job? No, he just kept going. He was collared on the roof. Mm -hmm. Anything incriminating on him? No. It doesn't look like you have much of a case. I didn't think so either till we booked Craig on suspicious conduct and went over to search his hotel room. Oh, did you find anything? No jewels, but quite a few settings. Uh. They looked kind of familiar, but I couldn't make them. Then this morning I remembered seeing descriptions of every one of them. Where? In a notice your office sent out. They were stolen last month back east. Oh, you talked to Craig since then? No, I came right up here. Thanks, Hank. I'll go over and see him now. With this kind of proof, maybe he'll talk. Dickie! Dickie! Go home, Peggy. I want to put the 
dollars. But I've got something to tell you. What? It's about Mr. Mitchell. He got hurt. Huh? It happened a little while ago. How do you know? Well, I, I was playing in front of the house, and all of a sudden there were a lot of men, uh, policemen and everything. And an ambulance came and took Mr. Mitchell away. Well, how was he hurt? Somebody hit him. Gee. I know who it was. Who? That man. What man? The man we saw when we were hiding behind the pipes. I heard a policeman say they found Mr. Mitchell by the incinerator. Remember, the man asked Mr. Mitchell to take him over there. Uh-huh. And all the policemen in front of the house were going around asking people if they knew who did it. Well, did they ask you? No. Well, if they do, don't tell them. Why not? Because then Mom will know we're in the basement again. She won't give us any allowance. Oh. So if you want to go to the movies on Saturday, we'd better keep quiet. I just finished interviewing Al Craig. Get anything, Jim? Mostly insults. Craig says we planted evidence in his room to frame him. I got something a few minutes ago that might tie in. No, what is it? I got a call from the precinct captain in the River Drive district. Yeah. A man named Mitchell who works in the building Craig entered last night was found unconscious on the floor in the basement near the incinerator. Well, how does that tie in with Craig? Mitchell said he was attacked by a man who came to get a bag of jewelry out of the incinerator. Oh? He described the man? No, he passed out before he could. Where is this Mitchell now? City Hospital. He's still unconscious, though. The doctor said he'd call as soon as he can be questioned. Hello? Ben? Mm-hmm. Charlie. You idiot. Well, what's the matter? Who told you to slug the old man? Well, I had to. When he saw what was in that bag, he said he'd have to turn it over to the superintendent. Have you got it? In my kick. Anybody besides the old man see you? No. Wait about an hour and call me back. What for? If the cops are gone by then, you can drive over here and meet me in front of the building. When do I get paid off? After I examine the stuff. Now, look, It's not man, that I I've don't trust you, Charlie, but I'd hate to pay $500 for a box of candy. Pinky! Pinky! What? You know what I just saw? A saber-toothed tiger? No! You know Mr. Evans? Oh, um, uh, oh, the nice man who gives us candy? Uh-huh. Well, he was talking to another man in a car. It was the man we saw in the basement. Oh, it, did he hit Mr. Evans? No, they were just talking. Are you sure it was him? Yeah. I think we ought to tell Mr. Evans to be careful. Come on. Okay. Mr. Evans! Mr. Evans! Oh, hello there. Well, tell him, Dickie. All right. You know that man you were just talking to? Which one? He was in a car that was here a couple of minutes ago. What about him? Well, go ahead, Dickie. He's the one who hit Mr. Mitchell. Now, whatever makes you think that? We saw him in the basement today. You did? Yes. He asked Mr. Mitchell to show him where the incinerator was. You must be mistaken. It couldn't be the same man. Well, it is. I know it. You're sure? Yes. Come on, children. We'd better talk this thing over. Where are we going, Mr. Evans? For a little ride in my car. <laughs> We will return in just a minute to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now a quick interview with a man who can honestly say... For me, life began at 60. About 20 years ago, Mr. George Snyder started an equitable independent 60s plan. Today, his plans all paid up. He's resigned from his job to enjoy the three freedoms that go with an equitable independent 60s plan. First... Freedom from job worries and money worries. Financial independence. As long as I live, the postman's going to bring me a check from the Equitable Society every single month. 
I'll never have to ask anybody for help. Second, independent 60s means that you're free to live anywhere you choose. Mr. Keating, I've moved back to the little country town I grew up in. It's been the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me. Third, freedom to do the things you've always wanted to do. We go in for gardening in a big way. My wife has flowers, and I've got a quarter of an acre in vegetables. And just think. I'm a man who once thought he couldn't afford an independent 60s plan. Who opened your eyes? My equitable society representative. It's a fact. You don't have to earn big money to begin an equitable independent 60s plan. Ask your equitable representative to explain why you probably have a big head start towards independent 60s because of Social Security and life insurance already owned. Often... Only a small amount of additional insurance is all that's required. A few dollars a week did it for me. Friends, why not profit by Mr. Snyder's example? Why not phone your Equitable Society representative without delay? Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Perilous Secret. Cartoonists through the years have enjoyed the plaudits of the people, and in most cases, rightly so. For by their efforts, they have caused laughter to ripple across the nation, and indeed around the world. Most people are familiar with their work, with the stout, cruel, well-dressed figure that denotes a business tycoon, with the criminal almost invariably shown to be leering, trigger-happy, and hard-faced. Fortunately, the majority of readers have come to know that business tycoons are not of necessity ogres, and have grown to realize that most of the stock characters in cartoons are figments of an artist's imagination. However, unfortunately, people have not realized that in regards to criminals. They have not yet accepted the fact as truth that a man can break every law ever written into the books and still appear as innocent as a statue of justice. Witness the man we have called Evans in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. He is urbane and charming with children and grown-ups alike. True, his charm is counterfeit, but the world does not know that. And neither would you if you met him at a club or a friend's house or anywhere else. The variety of physical appearance among the criminals of America is as great as it is among decent law-abiding citizens. That is the point your FBI would like you to take away from this evening's program. Phrased differently, don't suspect every stranger of being a criminal, but also don't be too sure he's not. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. I think I've got something, Hank. What? I went over to that apartment building where old man Mitchell was slugged. I talked to the superintendent. Mm -hmm. I took a copy of a list of the tenants. One of them is a man named Ben Evans. He's a jeweler, at least he claims to be. Actually, he's a fence for stolen jewelry. Yes, I've heard of him. Oh? Well, Hank, I figure that Craig had some loot on him when he entered that apartment house last night. He knew he was being followed. He dropped the bag down the incinerator. Mm, Could be. Well, if I'm right, he was probably making a delivery to Evans. It's going to be tough to make that stick. Yeah, I know. Oh, pardon me, Anthony. Sure. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Uh, Dr. Corday at City Hospital, Mr. Taylor. Oh, yes, Dr. Corday. Mr. Mitchell has regained consciousness. I understand you wanted to question him. That's right, Doctor, we do. Thank you for calling, sir. I'll be right down. Children? Yes, Mr. Evans? How would you like me to tell you a little story? Oh, I like stories. Good. Well, let's see if I can think of one. Uh, oh, th- th- this is a good one. One time, there were two children. They were just about your ages. The boy was 11 and the girl was 8. Uh, oh, I'm 9. Oh, well, anyway, they found out that a certain man had done something bad. They told on him. And do you know what happened? No. He was sent to prison for 20 years. But he didn't stay there that long. 
In a little while, he escaped. I saw a man escape from jail in a movie. No, but he, he knew that the little children had told on him, and he was very mad at them. Well, after he escaped, he waited until it got real dark. And then, after the little boy and his sister were asleep, he climbed in their window. <gasps> and then he took oh. out a long knife, oh. a great big long one, and he killed them both. Oh, I don't like that story. Uh, I'm not finished yet. After he killed them, he went in with another knife, even bigger and longer than the first one, and he killed their mommy and daddy. Oh, no more, Mr. Evans. Don't tell me anymore. Me either. You wouldn't want that to happen to you, would you? Oh, no. Then the best thing you can do is forget you ever saw that man in the basement. Detective Walden speaking. Jim Taylor, Hank. Yes, Jim. Where are you? Still at the hospital. Get anything from old man Mitchell? Well, I'm not sure. What about an eye dent on the man who attacked him? Not a very good one, Hank. But the location of his injury shows he was struck from in front. He must have seen the man. Well, I've got a tentative suspect, Hank, but only tentative. How'd you come up with him? Well, from the vague description that Mitchell gave me, I had some pictures taken out of our files and sent down here. He picked one out, but he's not sure it's the right man. Who is it? Somebody named Charlie Larimer. Oh, yes, I know him. Hmm? Betty Larceny Hoodlum. Been arrested a couple of times for rolling drunks. Yeah. Well, the old man said there's a chance I might be able to find out whether or not it really was Larimer. How? Two of the children who live in the building were in the basement at the time. They were hiding behind some pipes, but Mitchell thinks they got a look at his visitor. So I'm going to go up and see the children right now. Okay. As soon as I finish talking to them, Hank, I'll call you back. <laughs> You're Dick and Peggy Sterling, aren't you? How do you know? Well, the doorman just told me. Can I talk to you for a couple of minutes? What for? I'm from the FBI. A G-man? Yes. A real one? That's right. I've just been to the hospital to see Mr. Mitchell. Oh, how is he? He's getting better. Oh, I'm glad. He told me that you were in the basement this morning when a man came down there. He did? Mm Mm-hmm. Did you see the man? Did you? You you both like Mr. Mitchell, don't you? Well, well, sure. And you don't think it's right for anybody to hurt him, do you? No. Well, I'd like to find the man who hit Mr. Mitchell. Now, if you saw him, you can help him. How? Well, I've got a picture that Mr. Mitchell asked me to show you. He thinks that the man who hit him. Here, see if you do. You recognize him? <laughs> Is that the man you saw in the basement? I, I wish you'd answer my question. You leave us alone. We don't want our mommy and daddy to be killed. Where, where did you get that idea? Don't say anything more to him, Peggy. Let's go to the house. Come on. Just a minute. Hello, Mr. Evans. Hello, children. Can we talk to you, please? Surely. Come on in. Mr. Evans. What? We have something to tell you. A secret? A a G-man came to see us. What? A real G-man, Mr. Evans. When? Just now. What did he want? He showed us a picture of that man. Which man? The one you were talking to. He wanted to know if we saw him in the basement today with Mr. Mitchell. Did you tell him? No, we did what you said. We didn't say anything to him. You're both smart children. Uh, uh, wait right here. Hello? Charlie, Ben. You seen the stuff yet? Yes, but we're in a jam. Why? Two kids spotted you in the basement this morning. They saw me talking to you. Oh? I've got them scared enough not to talk, but the old man at the hospital must have put the finger on you. Cop was around a little while ago and showed the kids your picture. You want me to come up and get them? No, I'll take care of them. How? 
Um, I can lock them in a closet up here if anything should happen to them. But like maybe not having enough air to breathe, I can say it was an accident. And then do I get my 500? Sure. See me at the store in the morning. Children, will you come in here a minute? Mind if I come in with a... This is a G-man, Mr. Evans. I figured somebody was scaring these kids to keep them quiet. Now, just a minute. Come on, Evans. We've got a lot to talk about. Ben Evans and Al Craig were convicted in federal court for violating the interstate transportation of stolen property statute. Charlie Larimer was turned over to local authorities and received a five-year sentence in state penitentiary. Before taking Evans to headquarters, Special Agent Taylor put a search warrant he was carrying to good use and located not only the package of jewels, but also a large cache of other stolen gems. Charlie Larimer was picked up at his furnished room a short while later. In tonight's case, you met one of the real enemies of every law enforcement officer, and also of you, the people, the fence. This receiver of stolen property usually maintains a respectable front for his illegal operations, a disguise which makes it unusually difficult to secure evidence against him. However, no fence ever gets away with it for very long. Sooner or later, either the local police or special agents of your FBI or both working together find the chink in his armor. The files on some of those men have remained open for a long time, and some remain open today. When they will be closed, no one can foretell. Criminals are apprehended every hour around the clock, for the field offices of the Federal Bureau of Investigation never close. Regarding those currently unsolved cases, you can be sure of one thing. Every special agent will continue to work on each of the files until they too end as the evenings did, with the arrest and conviction of the wanted criminals. <laughs> Let's quickly review the three freedoms you can assure for yourself with an equitable, independent 60s plan. First, freedom from money worries and job worries after your 60th birthday. Real financial independence. Second, freedom to live where you choose. Third, freedom to do the things you've always wanted to do. That's the good life you can look forward to with an independent 60s plan. Don't say you can't afford it until you've talked to your Equitable Society representative. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a story revealing the intricate machinations of a criminal syndicate. Its subject, Shakedown. Its title, The Muscle Factory. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Edmund McDonald, Henry Morgan, Norma Jean Nilsson, Ted Osborne, Victor Rodman, and Jeff Silver. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Muscle Factory on This Is Your FBI. The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, fun for the whole family, follows immediately over most of these ABC stations.